So about a year ago, um, our business manager, Scott, he's like, hey, um, I got a grill for sale. Would you be interested in, in buying it? I said, um, yeah. I preface this with, I have a lot of experience cooking in the kitchen. I do. I, I'm, I'm, a really good, I'm a really good cook. And I've, I've cooked for other people, and they're like, wow, this is you know, like, like a steak. They're like, this is the big, best steak I've ever had. And anyways, when it comes to grilling, not so much. I'm not, I don't have as much experience. I mean, it's easy to grill a burger. And, but beyond that, not much experience. So I said, yeah, I'll buy it from you. And, and I buy it. And he said, well, don't forget, you got to get, you know, you just need to get a propane tank. I said, okay, sure, no problem. So take the, the grill home, buy it from him, clean it up, and uh, get it. Everything's, you know, good to go. And, of course, you know, I, I can't just, like, start using it because I don't have propane and I don't have any grilling utensils either so i have to have the right stuff to make it to make it work and some of you might remember this story from a year ago uh told from brian's perspective <laughs> and uh i am definitely the muse for probably 65 to 70 percent of his stories and i'm okay with that but this is uh, i guess my perspective so <laughs> again i have no experience with grills so I go, I tell Tara, I'm like, hey, I'm going to go off to Tractor Supply and buy some propane. She said, okay. Go to Tractor Supply, go in the store, and right there in kind of a grilling section is a propane tank, $35. I'm like, seems a little steep, but whatever, you know, I don't know. So I get it, go home, and I hook it up, open the valve, hit the igniter, no flames. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. And so I'm checking everything, I'm checking everything, and I just get so frustrated. And I call Brian, I'm like, dude, this is ridiculous. I'm just going give to this, give this back to Scott. I'm like, I don't even care about getting my money back. This is, this is crazy. He's like, let me, let me come over and look at it. So he comes over, and we try a few different things, and, and we try a little soap and water, you know, in the propane tank to see if it's leaking. Well, it's not leaking. And even if it had a hole, it wouldn't leak. He picked it up. He's like, oh, you idiot. There's nothing in this. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? I just bought it. And he's like, there's no propane in here. I was like, you got to be kidding me. So I spent $35 on a brand new propane tank with no fuel in it at all. Useless. I take it to, uh, he said, get in the car. So he, <laughs> we drive to, I think, Napa or whatever and get it filled up for only $17. And the guy takes the propane tank, and he's filling it up, and he looks at me. He goes, man, it's a nice-looking tank. You already used it all up already? I was like, nope, bought it empty. And I could just see what he was thinking. He didn't say it, but I could see it. He just said, hmm. And he looked down, did not look at me, did not say anything to me. I felt like such an idiot. And Brian's just laughing, and he's on his phone typing, making sure he's getting the story every bit of it. And I'm like, really? Come on. I was like, don't tell this story. He's like, oh, I'm telling this story. It's perfect sermon illustration. I'm like, great. Well, you know, Brian asked me to preach today, and, and um, you know, the Lord gave me this parable, and I was thinking of a good opening story, and I was like, come on, really? I don't want to tell that story again, but I'm telling on myself. The point is, is I, I bought a beautiful brand new propane tank and it was empty and it was pointless. Like it has to have, you know, something in it for it to go. So this morning we're going to be looking at one of Jesus' parables that is entitled the parable of the ten virgins. And Jesus didn't just randomly tell uh, this parable, nor was anything that he did or said random uh, or without purpose. And in the previous chapter in uh, Matthew chapter 24, Jesus tells his disciples um, what's going to happen at the end of the age, and he gives them signs that will signify that his return is near. And after he tells them that, he goes into this parable. And I'm just going to be up front with you uh, right, at the, right out the gate that Jesus gives this parable to, to stress the importance of constant personal spiritual preparedness. 
And so I want you to have that kind of at the forefront of your minds as we're, as we're going through this. Um, and it's a warning to those who are lackadaisical in their walk with Christ. So there are two things that we know for sure when we look at this parable. And that is what or who the term bridegroom um, represents and that Jesus is talking about his imminent return. Um, so this morning, if you have your smartphones or your tablets or you have your Bibles, kicking it old school with the paper, that's cool. Um, or if you just want to follow along on, on the screens, it'll be up there. Um, we're going to start in verse 1 of chapter 25 in Matthew. And it reads like this. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Now, to understand the imagery here, in this parable, we need to understand how things worked in ancient Jewish culture. So first, let's look at the term bridegroom and why it's so significant here. Typically, when you think of a wedding, you're going to think of a bride, and then you're going to think of a groom. Typically, in our Western culture, the term bridegroom really isn't used. Um, but during Jesus' time, when he tells this parable, the soon-to-be groom would also be called the bridegroom. And he would give a dowry for his bride. Now, a dowry was a bride price or a bride wealth. And a dowry was a payment made by a man to uh, the family of the woman that he desired to marry. For example, Jacob didn't have a lot of money, but he gave of labor to his soon-to-be father-in-law, Laban. Now, he kind of got screwed out of that deal. I mean, it depends on how you look at it, I guess. He said, I'm going to work seven years for this daughter. He worked seven years, was deceived, was given a different daughter. So he's like, that's not the one I wanted. I'm going to work seven more years to get the daughter that I requested in the first place. So he worked 14 years and has two wives. Some may say, oh, that's great, two wives. Smart people would say, how? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, no. But this tradition um, is still practiced in a lot of uh, Middle Eastern cultures. Um, again, like over here in the West, that's not something that we would do, thankfully. Um, else, a lot of us wouldn't be married. We, as guys would just be walking around, well, <laughs> couldn't afford a bride, you know. Um, we just usually ask for the, the daughter's hand in marriage from the, from the father. Why is this so significant, though? So Jesus is also known to us as the bridegroom, and we as a church are labeled as the bride of Christ. A dowry or a bride price was paid for us when Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross on our behalf. So we have been bought with a price. So next, let's look at, let's look at the lamps. Now, these lamps... They're not big fancy pieces of furniture from Ikea with a 60-watt light bulb in it that somebody puts the lampshade on their head. It's not that kind of lamp. These were small little uh, clay lamps, and they were also called Herodian lamps. And they would use olive oil as the fuel and a cotton wick that stuck out of the, out of the lamp base. And the oil would last them for just a few hours depending on the size of this lamp. So if your journey didn't last very long, maybe an hour or two, you would just go with the oil that's in there and call it good. And so if you had farther to go, naturally, though, you're going to bring an excess of oil to replenish it once it runs out. I mean, at least that's what common sense tells us. But we've learned that with common sense, not everybody has it. Um, you know, and it, it's sad. Now, in this procession through the streets, after it's after nightfall, every person of the wedding party is going to have their own lamp. And it was kind of required and expected of them to carry their own lamp because without those, they would be assumed to be party crashers or unwelcome guests. So let's, let's continue reading verse 2. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. Now, here's the fun part. <laughs> I love the Bible. Um, the Greek word used here for foolish is moros. <laughs> you already know how to translate it. It doesn't mean that these five versions were just silly. It means that they were morons, <laughs> right? So Jesus is saying there were five who were smart. They had common sense. Five were morons. So 
verse 3 explains to us why five of these were morons and, and five were smart, in my opinion, or simply had common sense. Um, it says, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. That's why they were wise. The other ones did not take any. So, you know, not taking any oil for their lamps on this, this long procession, waiting for the bridegroom. It's like buying a car of your dreams, right? And not putting any gas in it and never taking it anywhere. It's just sitting there. It's pointless. It's meant to be driven, right? I mean, these, the times that we live in, I, I get it. Like we have to sell our organs on the black market just to fill up the tank. But it's, it's the same thing. So we have 10 virgins heading out towards a marriage feast. They're part of the wedding party. Five, five smart, five morons. So verse 5, as the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. So notice how it says that they slept. In the Bible, a lot of times, um, falling asleep is used as language uh, for saying that someone died or passed away. They fell asleep. Uh, so so um, back in the day, before we had streaming and everything, we had ads that interrupted our streaming service like YouTube or Hulu. We would watch cable television, right? And we'd have commercials. And a lot of times there'd be infomercials. And according to Brian, he loves the shopping network and he loves those. I don't know why. It's weird. Um, and I get to say that because I'm up here and he's not. <laughs> No. Uh, so we would have those commercials, and there will always be just some kind of weird product, like some brand new scientific discovery of Tupperware, and some actor holding the Tupperware that just acted ridiculous. Or it would be like a pan, and they did something really stupid and got something stuck in the pan, and they're just freaking out. And it's like, calm down, just wash it. <laughs> but they had some like nonstick pan, whatever it is. And there's a narrator and a voice saying... Uh, take advantage of this offer. If you call in the next five minutes, you'll get this other product for free and we'll slash the price in half. But you have to call in the next five minutes or we'll be gone forever, ever, ever. So, it was, like, we, we all know those commercials, right? So, they had that five-minute window and if you didn't call, you didn't get the extra product. We have to realize, though, that once we've fallen asleep, once we die, that's it. There's, there's no multiple chances uh, after that, there's no undo button. There's no chance to reset. Uh, the time for action is now. We're not promised our next breath. We have the assurance of eternal life through Jesus Christ, right? But we don't have the assurance that our bodies are going to live past tomorrow. We, we don't. We could just be struck dead inst instantaneously. So what you do in this life matters. It matters. Do you choose to reject God completely? Or do you choose to follow Jesus? And I get that some people, they're, they're on different journeys than everybody else, and they're trying to work things out. But I just want to tell you that you can't ride the fence forever. Eventually, the fence line is going to run out, and you're going to be on one side or the other. So what you do now, it matters. And I know that's a little heavy, but you talk to him. He's the one that said it. <laughs> so looking at verse 6. At midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. Notice how all the virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. They were all ready for that point and to go forward. And we see what time that the bridegroom is coming out. It's, it's at midnight. Seems kind of late for a wedding party, right? If I was going to be there in town... Sleeping, I'd be like, what is going on? It is midnight. Why are you hooping and hollering for a wedding? Nobody cares. It was like last night. Like, I was really tired and went to bed early, um, about 8.30. And I kept hearing this. I'm like, who's shooting off a cannon? And I thought, well, maybe it's my fan. So I turned it off. And, and no, I could still hear it. And I opened the back door, and somebody's shooting off fireworks. And I'm like, you got to be. I just want to go to sleep. <laughs> so he comes at midnight. Um, looking, looking at verse 8 through 9. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, There will not be enough for us and for you. Go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. 
the bridegroom has finally arrived to collect his bride. So it was customer, customary for that day for him to now walk with the bride and the wedding party to his house for the wedding feast. So we have ten virgins that were part of the wedding party. He was expected after dark, which is why they had the lamps in the first place, right? But he was delayed, so they fell asleep. And so the original oil that was in there, in their lamps that they had brought with them, ran out for all of them. But five of them brought surplus for themselves to make it the rest of the way. Five, as we know, were morons. They did not. And so they're asking, hey, give us some of your oil so we can all get there too. But, you know, the ones with common sense, like, hey, if we give you some of our oil, we're just going to make it together a little bit of ways and none of us will make it. So you go hurry up and go try to find some, and, and you know, we're going to go out, out there. So it's a little bit hard because it's midnight. What oil dealer is going to be open at midnight? I mean, they didn't have 24-hour 7-Elevens in Jesus' time. So it was late. So we look at uh, verse 10, and it says this. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. I want to read that one more time. So leave the scripture up there. I really want this to sink in. And while they were going to buy, so we have the ten virgins, five leave. Five remain. They're the ones that were ready. They're the ones that were prepared. The bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. So I've, I've flown what feels like way too much this year. Uh, and each time, it's 1,200 miles each way, um, which is probably not a whole lot in the sense of where we can all fly to nowadays. But I flew down to Texas for my grandmother's funeral, uh, for a family trip to see other family, to officiate a wedding. And, but I will say, regardless of the destination, I always am sure to I'll make a checklist on my phone. And I will pack all the stuff that I have on my checklist. And I'll make that checklist before I even have to pack. So I have that ready. And then I pack all the stuff I need to do, check it off as I go. And once I pack and check everything off my list, I make sure that I make preparations to get to the airport at a reasonable time. You know, because I'd rather get to the airport probably an hour and a half to two hours before. Because honestly, I'd rather be waiting at the gate, ready to go, then be stressing to, to get there on time because gates constantly change. You could have on your ticket or whatever saying gate three or whatever, and all of a sudden it changes to 21, and you have to hike to the other side of the, the terminal just to get there. So anyways, because I can tell you, it, it doesn't matter what time of day it is. It can be 2 in the morning or 2 in the afternoon. TSA will always have a long line in it, and there's always moros in line, (laughs) and they're just taking their time, lollygagging. Oh, it's it's frustrating. So that's when you start praying for, you know, joy and peace to fill your life and the Holy Spirit to to control your your tongue and all that kind of stuff. So, but when it comes to flying, you just have to be prepared and ready, right? So here's the punch to the gut these verses are communicating. Preparation is what you do before something happens. It's not what happens during, and it's not what happens after. Once the bridegroom arrived, it was too late to prepare or handle unexpected circumstances. It will be too late to prepare for Christ's return after he has already come back. And just like the virgins who had a surplus of oil and were ready, we must live in a state of constant readiness. And how do we do that? I'm so glad you asked. We pursue after the heart of God. We must have a saving faith in Jesus Christ. And what does saving grace and faith look like in a believer's life? So this is not going to be up there. I just want to read this to you real quick. Titus chapter 2, 11 through 14 tells us this. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness 
and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So the saving grace of God has brought us salvation and it trains us through the power of the Holy Spirit to reject ungodliness and instead to live godly lives. And we see that it says in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope. So waiting, we're prepared, we're ready, we're watching for the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. So we're waiting for him. And it says, who gave himself to redeem us, meaning that he paid for us, right? So we have to pursue after the heart of God. Nothing else matters. I'll just tell you that right now. I'm not saying forsake all responsibilities you have on earth and become a hermit on an island. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is when we pursue after the heart of God, when we, when we pursue after being in His perfect will and walking in the purpose that He has for our lives, everything else is going to fall into place. When it comes to marriages, our goal is not to, to live in perfect harmony. I mean, yes, it is. Don't, don't twist my words. <laughs> you know, our goal shouldn't, our main goal should not be focused on our, on our spouse. Our spouse should never be way up here. We shouldn't lift our spouse. We should be together. And our main focus together should be God. We must pursue after the heart of God. And everything else will fall into place. So we have to stop focusing on so much on the things that don't matter. We have to stop knocking God down off the, off the throne of our hearts and seek after Him with fervor with everything that we have. And... So, to stress more the point of being ready and the fact that after death, that's it. There are no more second chances. I want to stress with an earlier chapter in Matthew. Again, this is not up there. But I really, 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 really want this to sink in. What Jesus is saying here. It's Matthew seven twenty one through 23. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. He's not talking about sinners here. He's not talking about people who aren't Christ followers. He's talking about people who claim the title of Christianity. Those are the ones crying, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all this stuff in your name? Didn't we go to church on Sundays? Didn't we give to the church? And yet, here he's saying, depart from me. I don't even know you. So we have to seek after the heart of God and walk in the purpose of and the will he has for our lives. Let's look at the last few verses, Matthew 25. So afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. And the virgins who were foolish with their oil supply, they didn't make it in time to get into the marriage feast. And by the time they got there, the door was already shut. It was too late. We have the five wise ones who had the extra oil, right? And those represent those of us who are true Christ followers and those that pursue after the heart of God and have an active relationship with Him. And then you have the five foolish ones that claim, like I said, claim the title of of Christian without ever practicing or living out what that actually means. And they come to church, they give all that, but their lives are in ruins. They're lazy and they're complacent and they don't have a true love for Christ. Again, I know this is heavy. I'm sorry. But it's, it's almost as if they subconsciously believe that they can get a ticket into heaven just by their association with actual Christ followers. It's almost like as a Christ follower, we just have pixie dust that we can just brush off ourselves and people around us can get saved or something. It, it doesn't work like that. So that we have the ten virgins, and they represent those of us who have faith in Jesus. 
have been, have been exposed to the truth. So we've been taught the gospel and how to live our lives. And the wise and foolish virgins both had been invited, right, to the wedding feast, and they were both aware of the importance of the occasion. But five prepared to go all the way. Five did not, and they did not make it. So the responsibility of having oil in our personal lamps, it's an individual requirement. It is one of spiritual preparedness that cannot be, it can't be shared. Um, growing up, I heard the statement, and it, it's still true today, that you can't get into heaven on your grandparents' salvation. You can't get into heaven on your parents' salvation. It's something that you have to work out for yourself. And so we've seen similarities in what I read to you from Matthew 7 and, and here in Matthew 25 where Jesus is telling them, I don't know you. And so what does it even mean for Jesus to know us? Isn't Jesus God meaning that he is all-knowing just like the Father? Yes, of course, in that sense, he does. But what it means for Jesus to really know us is that we have an active relationship with him. For Jesus to know us means that we have accepted him as the Lord and Savior of our lives, following after him every single day listening to his voice. Well, how do we hear his voice? Read the Bible. That is God's word. You want to hear God speak into your life, read the word. It will change your life, I promise. And honestly, there's no, there's no excuse not to because it's, it's available to us in bookstores, it's available online, it's available for free, free, through apps, through um, whatever, with our smartphones, our tablets, we can read it, or we can even choose to have it read to us. There's a little narrator that reads it to us. So there's no excuse not to read the Bible and to get it into our lives. And you say, well, I'm blind, I can't operate a smartphone. Well, they make Braille. Learn Braille. Or have somebody else read it to you, something like that. So I'm going to ask you, do you want Jesus to know you when that time comes, or are you satisfied with him saying, I never knew you? I really hope that you long for that closeness with him. We have to live in a state of constant readiness because like verse 13 said, you don't know the day or the hour. And we can meet Jesus here in the next few moments by means of his, his return or we could meet him you know, tomorrow because we just croak. Again, we're not assured our next breath. So we have to live in a state of constant readiness. And so every now and then I'll be on, uh, be on Facebook, not, not very often, but every now and then be on Facebook, and, and there will be these little, little ads or articles that will pop up saying, um, you know, top 50 photos of uh, World War II or photos you've never seen of time travelers caught. You know, that's a, that's a fun one. Um, but there was one that, I was like, oh, this is really cool. And it was these, um, these pictures of these massive ships and these massive planes that had either crashed or stalled, and they were stuck there at their final resting place, and nature had just taken over these vessels, right? While I was looking at it, what I noticed is that these massive ships and these massive planes were only just a few clicks away from land or their final destination, but the problem is, is they didn't have enough to make it there. And I can tell you that this, this is not an age race. This is not a, a young and old thing. Well, you know, the older you get, the more you have one foot in the grave and one foot out. You know, no. It's not an age thing. Because all of us, every single one of us is on borrowed time. Young, old, it doesn't matter. Because we're not promised tomorrow. So what you do with your time matters. How you run your race now is what matters. Are we filled with the Holy Spirit? Does our life bear the fruits of the Spirit? Are we living in the freedom that Christ bought for us by the laying down of his life? Are we making it to where that sacrifice was in vain? So as, as I close, I want you to notice something about your lamp, about your life. Remember how the lamps they used in biblical times were, were small uh, clay lamps that shed only uh, enough light for them to see one step or two at a time. They were, they were small, had a little flame. It's like taking out a big lighter 
and then using it as a lamp. You can only see just so far in front of you. You know, they didn't have like a giant mag light, right? They couldn't see their, their final destination. So they only saw one step at a time. And as Christ followers, our walk with God is very much the same. We may think that, you know, we know what we're going to be doing one month, six months, a year, five years from now. But I guarantee you, you don't actually know. If you did, if, and if you do, please share me the, your secret and then play the lottery and, and share that too. But we can only see one step at a time in front of us. How many remember the movie... Uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Great movie. So he gets past a couple of different traps, right? And he gets past uh, the floor where he's spelling out God's name. And he comes to this opening, and there's just this gap. And he's, you know, freaking out. And so there's this gap between where he is and where he needs to be, like this big drop-off, right? And he's like, you know, there's, there's no way that anybody can get across this. And the whole time his dad is laying, you know, out in the main entrance area, dying, muttering, you must have faith, boy, Sean Connery. So, um, and, and then it kind of clicks. And he's like, oh, you, it's, it's a step of faith. So I'm just going to demonstrate the scene. So he, he closes his eyes, takes a deep breath, sticks his leg out, and just drops. And then he, he lands on the bridge and then the camera pans and we see it's like a camouflage type bridge and it was there the whole time but he couldn't really see it from his his perspective so and he can see all the the little traps that he got past he can see back on all those and of course the bad guys can too because they're you know they're coming up but it's a leap of faith so I just want to say there's no easy days in our lives. There are only days that are less hard. But we press on because we utilize the strength that God gives us. So in the same way with that, that movie, we see and we walk one step at a time, and each step that we take is lit up. And there's going to be some times where when we take that step of faith, it's not even lit up till our foot touches the ground, and then we realize, okay, yeah, there is a step there. And so we keep going forward, right? And... What I want you to realize is that we, we can't see, we know where we're going. As Christ followers, we know where and what our final destination is, but we can't necessarily see it on the timeline. We don't know when it's going to happen, but we keep pressing forward. We keep taking one step at a time, and each step is a step of faith. But what's really awesome is we can look back, and all those previous steps are lit up, and we can see all the times that God has shown his goodness and his kindness. We can look back and see all the miracles, all the breakthroughs in our lives, remembering his goodness. So I just want to encourage you to keep going forward, living a life that is completely sold out to God and living your life in a constant state of preparedness to meet Jesus. Father, this morning I just ask that you would speak to our hearts, God. I ask that in these moments, uh, as, we, as we go into one more song, I just ask that if there's anyone here that doesn't quite know you or their life is not what they wanted it to be, I ask that you would speak to their hearts, God. And I ask that in this building, those watching online, that if there are those that have calluses and, and walls built up around their heart, I ask that the power of your Holy Spirit would just break those down. And I ask that you would speak into our lives, God. Help us and equip us with the fruits of your Spirit to be, help us to be ready to meet you when that time comes. Help us to have a, a, a sense of urgency about us. Help us to be prepared. Prompt us and remind us to be prepared, to seek after you with everything that we have. God, help us get to a point to where we are in an, almost a state of desperation because nothing else in this life matters except for you. And pursuing after your heart, living in your will, walking out your purpose for our lives, God. We ask that you 
ask it all in Jesus' name.